our elder team, and I want to really highlight that, our elder team uh, has been working on uh, hours after hours after hours and, and praying over what are our core values at Ecclesia. Like, yes, we're going to make disciples, but who are we really? Like, well, like as, as we think about these core values and, and how we move forward, how do we really define that? You know, what defines our culture? What makes us different and unique? What are the behaviors that, that we want to model and see people that say, hey, I call Ecclesia my church home. What do we want to see? What is that about? And, and so uh, if you're here and you're new or you're just like, hey, I'm checking it out, these are the perfect Sundays to check it out as we walk through what that is and what we've come up with. And like I said, I want to highlight elder team because this wasn't like me somewhere on a mountain with just me and God and it's like Steve's vision, okay? Okay. Uh, that would go very quickly up and very quickly down. Uh, this is what we believe collectively together. We believe this is what God's called us to do and, and, and how we, we need to move forward well. And so uh, this is, this is a, a big thing for us. And what we've come up with is six of these core values. And each week I'm going to talk about two of them. And, uh, and so as, as we go into this, I want you to just be thinking and, and, and allow God to work on your heart because you may even hear things that you've heard before, but sometimes God reiterates something you've heard before because you didn't listen to it the first time. And so our very first core value as we kick this thing off is glorify Jesus. Glorify Jesus. That is the first core value uh, at Ecclesia. And, and who we are, who we want to be. And these are in order. And, and so as we think about that, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, 18, uh, it says this. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Peter is not being called the rock. That would be cool, but that's, that's not what's happening. What the rock is, is Peter's confession that Jesus is the living God. The truth on which the church is founded. You know, in Ephesians 2.20, it teaches us that the church is built on Jesus, the chief cornerstone. In 1 Corinthians 10.4, it talks about how Jesus is called the rock. He is the founder. He's the builder. He is the leader of the church. So he gets to define what we're supposed to look like and how we're supposed to operate. And, you know, I, and I hear people say this. A lot, actually, when I tell them what I do. Um, you know, well, well, I'm done with church. Or I, I hate the church. And that usually creates an awkward conversation because I'm like, that's my whole world. But uh, it's kind of like having someone say, I hate what you do, okay? And, but I always ask, now, now hold up. Do you know who started the church? Oh, uh, it's probably some, uh. I go, well, Actually, Jesus started the church. So this was created by Jesus. So I actually don't think you're angry or upset at what Jesus has created. I think you're upset and angry at what people have done to distort what Jesus has created. I think you're, you're angry at what people have done in the name of church. People that have said, I am a Christian, and yet have done things to you or said things or modeled the opposite of what you thought to be true about Christianity. And you've maybe been hurt by, by those people. Maybe you've been hurt by, by church leaders, by pastors who have said something or, or done something. And you're, and you're angry. You're mad. You're hurt by that. And, and so your opinion of the church is that. It's not what Jesus created. It, you're mad at humanity. <laughs> you're mad at humans. And, and, and listen, when, when I think about uh, of, of this, like, and, and, and this is not just a, a church thing. Okay, like let's be honest. A lot of times we like to go, oh, that's just a church thing. Listen, some of you have been on a date and it went horrible and you said, I will never date again. Okay, some of you grew up and you saw your parents' marriage and or you've experienced uh, marriage and, and you've seen the ugly side of what it can be. You've seen the dysfunction of it, the betrayal of it, and you have said, I will never marry. Now, you're not mad at, at God for creating marriage. You're mad at what you've seen humans do. Some of you have been around other kids when they have skipped a nap, when they needed it. And you have said, I will never have one. Okay? Like, you're not mad at, like, like you're not like, why did God create kids? You can't be mad at that because you're here. But you, you may feel strongly because of what you've seen and experienced. Listen, like, like, it's not just a church problem. Okay? 
And when we think about it, Jesus hand-selected 12 guys to follow him, to be in his inner circle. And one of those guys handled the money, and he steal. He was stealing. Not only was he stealing, but then he took money in exchange to put Jesus on the cross. Now that is in Jesus' inner circle. If Jesus had issues, we're going to have issues. I know, I know. You're like, wow, vision Sunday. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, we're taking it. But let's be, let's be honest, right? Let's be honest. Because sometimes I, I honestly think that, that we just have this mindset that's not even real. And we totally ignore that. that like, like, listen, like people, uh, as we're on this earth, we're going to struggle with ourselves. We're going to struggle with thoughts, actions, and things that are in opposition to what we say we believe. And, and that's hypocritical. And we all have moments like this. And so I want to just encourage and challenge us. Like for those of you that may be upset, may be angry, may be wounded, let's call it what it is and not call it what it actually isn't. Let's not just blame what God has created and defined. Let's, let, let's just call it what it is. Like there, are, there is humanity within the framework of the body of Christ. And sometimes we act in that. But we see, uh, once again, that, that Jesus is the founder. He is the builder. In, in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, it says this. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now there's verses that we're going to look at today, and you almost just have to emphasize and read it slowly to completely really soak in what it's saying. Like, we exist at the core to make much of Jesus Christ in everything we do and say. Like, this is our primary purpose in life. We are created by him and for him. And he is the head of this body. He is the head of the church. I'm not, like, like you aren't, like, like Christ is. This is his body. It's to be a reflection of him. In Romans eleven thirty six, 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So he is the, he is the source, he is the sustainer, and he's the goal. By him, through him, and for him. So it's by him that we have access. It's by him coming that, that we have this opportunity to experience salvation. It's through him that we're able to operate in this how he's designed to, us to operate. Not only individually, but collectively. And then it's for him. Okay, we can never get that twisted. It has got to be for Jesus. This is why we exist. We, make, we exist to magnify and glorify him. That's what we're striving for. In Romans 15, 5 and 6, it says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we unify ourselves around Jesus, our voices start to become the voice of one. And then collectively, in harmony, we start to magnify Jesus. That's huge. When you think of anything incredible that's happened in history, uh, any movement, any, any political uh, achievement, it has been around a group unifying into one voice harmoniously to create incredible change. When we think about the church and we think about ourselves collectively coming together around the gospel for the purpose of magnifying Jesus Christ, our voices start to become one. Um, in, in seventh grade, now where I went to school, they had uh, seventh grade and eighth grade together in this town that I grew up in, and they didn't have sixth grade, it was just seventh and eighth. And I remember uh, when I was going into seventh grade and you sign up for your classes and that, and I remember one of my eighth grade friends, I had some eighth grade friends, and he, and he said, Steve, you should sign up for choir. Now, he'd never heard me sing, um, but I go, no, why would I sign up for choir? And he goes, 
for two reasons. It's an easy A, and all the good-looking girls are in choir. <laughs> and seventh and eighth grade are together. And so that made all the sense to me as a seventh grader because all of a sudden, slowly something happens around that age time where instead of telling someone else that you like them through the game of tag, you now want to hold their hand. And if you're seventh grade, we're watching you, we're on to you, okay? We already know. And we know what's going on. And so anyway, I remember sitting in there and I remember the teacher and the te teachers are not oblivious. They know. And so like, and I wasn't alone. There was like four of us. Okay, pretty obvious, and, and, and she's just like, listen, when they're singing, you guys just say watermelon, okay? Just watermelon, and that'll make everyone think that you are singing. And we're in this thing, and, and, and we're awful sounding, and, and our motives are wrong, we're off, we are a distraction, and, and, and you think of all those pieces coming together, and that choir class was a mess. It was. And when you think about the church sometimes, we can come in with our own agendas. We can come in going, oh, I want to get this out of it, or I'm actually about this. That's why I came. Um, and then there's some of us that are like, no, we're here for the right reasons. We want to we glorify Jesus. We're here. We're all in and that. But we all come in, and, and as we start pressing in, we actually see a lot of this dysfunction because we're not unified around the gospel. We're not harmonizing ourselves. You know, the University of Oregon has these a cappella teams, and they, like, compete, and it is incredible. And you listen to them, and they, like, sing, and, and, <laughs> and as they sing, well, I'm, like, trying to describe it because they make sounds for the music, too. So they're not just singing. They're, like, doing everything. And you're just sitting there, and I've gotten to watch it, and I'm just like, this is crazy. It is amazing how you are all harmonizing around and you're different. Some of you are higher, some of you are lower, and, 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 and some of you are like making sounds and all of these things, but it unifies itself around this incredible song and it just blows people away. You guys, as a church, if we are unifying and harmonizing ourselves around glorifying Jesus, our song becomes Jesus Christ and it is incredible what he does with it. It is incredible how he unifies us, how he harmonizes those of us who, who don't look like the other person, who sound differently, who, who come from different backgrounds. That's only what God can do, but it only can happen when we unify ourselves around glorifying Jesus Christ. And we believe that's what he wants to do here. In, in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that everything God, in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I should just pray. That's so good. Who Christ is and what he has done should impact how we sing, we teach, we pray, and we live. It should be for his glory. When I'm preparing to teach, it should be about how am I glorifying Jesus. When we sing songs, we should be asking whatever song, how is it glorifying Jesus? What's going on in our kids' ministries, how is it glorifying Jesus? Whatever's happening in our youth ministry, in our college ministry, in our homes, as we're mentoring, how is this glorifying Jesus? And this is exercised through our, our sacrificial service. It's exercised through our spiritual gifts. I mean, when you think about whether you're prepping muffins, you're, you're teaching, you're, you're parking, you're, you're greeting, you're hosting a community, you're mentoring, you're setting up, you're tearing down. Like, like, this is the why. This is the why. Have you ever just done something? You don't even really know why you're doing it. You just feel like you're supposed to. I feel like that's a lot of times that's what describes our people in church. This is the why. The why is always about Jesus Christ and to glorify Jesus. And we're saying that's, that's, that's what we're about. And, and if this starts to get distorted, it lo no longer becomes about him. It starts to become about me, and it starts to become about our agendas versus his agenda. And we start asking these questions. How does this make me feel? How do I get the credit? How do I get acknowledged? Did anyone notice me? 
That's my idea. Now, now, once again, these are not just like church issues. These happen all the time. Like, like I want to be acknowledged. Like, I want to be noticed. I mean, I struggle with that all the time. Like, even like when I think about in my marriage, the, I mean, the other night, I like put my head on my pillow and I look over and I'm like, man, so glad I could come home and do the dishes tonight. After a long day of work and I'm just glad I could do that for you and the kids. Um, you know, I know they didn't just wash themselves. So I'm just glad that, that I could serve you in that way. And God is just like, there goes your blessing. Like, <laughs> like, we, like, this is not just a church problem. It's not. And some of you are like, yeah, I just did that. Like, we, we do stuff like this all the time. All the time. It's in, it's in our humanity to want what we want, right? We want to be acknowledged. We want things to go our way. And so I, I, I don't say that to say, hey, what's wrong with you if you have this thought? Like, we all struggle with this thought. But the only thing that can combat that thought is the thought of, is this glorifying to Jesus? And when we think about, like, decisions we have to make and, and moving forward well, like, like that's got to be the grid. Right? Does this glorify Jesus? And, and, and so as you think about that, that, like, like that becomes the only opinion that matters. Because, man, we get so caught up in trying to please either people or we care about their opinion of us or how they perceive us. And listen, that, I've said this before, that is a rough way to live. Because people's opinions of you are going to change continually. Because people change continuously. Their feelings, our feelings go up and down. And so listen, if you're trying to live to, to please people, to get the opinion you want out of them, like it is going to drive you crazy and you're going to be exhausted. But when we actually come around and center ourselves around just glorifying Jesus, there is so much freedom in that, you know, and then I don't need to be noticed. I don't need to be acknowledged because I know he sees me and I know what this means to him. And that's enough. This will undoubtedly impact how we treat each other. Like, like, it is impossible for us to have the mindset, I'm going to glorify Jesus and not love other people. And that's why our second core value is love one another. Love one another. In, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, it says, And you shall love the Lord your God, and this is Jesus, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In John chapter 12, verses, verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay, so, so he says, listen, you, like, like, these are inseparable. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and, and then not love other people. Like, like, those are actually tied to each other. So if I'm not loving other people, there is a disconnect between me and my relationship with God. Because as a byproduct of that, I'm going to love other people. And how am I supposed to love other people? This is where it gets hard. Jesus says, I want you to love other people like I loved you. That's hard. Because then, throughout Jesus' life, remember, Jesus came on the scene, and some of you, when I said love other people, you're like, of course they'd say that. Like, like, and, and you just revert back to what's normal, your normal view of love. Like, listen, Jesus came onto the scene and turned the normal view of love upside down. Because love was all about an agenda. Love was all about appearance. Love was all about what can I get uh, from this relationship? How can I be promoted? How can I be noticed? And, and, and so when Jesus came on the scene, he goes, actually, this is about your heart. I'm in it for your heart. And how this is actually going to look, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this whole thing called sacrificial love. And, and, and so they start asking him questions about this. And then Jesus starts to teach about this. And as he starts to teach about it, People go, oh, no, <laughs> what kind of love is this? Like, for example, um, a, a lawyer asks Jesus, and, and, and this lawyer walks up, and, and, and listen, like in, in Luke chapter uh, 10, verses 25 through 37, a lawyer, and he's seeking to be justified. He wants to be noticed. He comes to Jesus, and he says, well, who, if you're a lawyer, we love you. Who is, 
<laughs> I don't know if you do that. Uh, I imagine you do. Who, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells a story. Jesus was an incredible storyteller. And Jesus tells a story of the Good Samaritan. He says, well, well, let me answer that. Okay, there's a guy, and he's walking to Jericho, and along the journey, along the path, he gets beaten and left for dead. And guess what? There's two individuals that end up walking by, and one was a Levite. And they're like, yeah, we get that, Jewish audience, Levite. And the Levite just, like, sees him and walks by. And a priest, and they're like, oh, a priest sees him. But the priest also walks by. And now they're probably doing this. And then Jesus says, and a Samaritan comes. Now remember, they hated Samaritans. They would walk around Samaria. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. They, they had a different way of, of worshiping and all this. And so as soon as he says a Samaritan came, you got to picture his audience going, they're just mad. And he says, but the Samaritan saw, and then the Samaritan went and took care of this man. Put him on his horse, took him in paid for a hotel, paid for him to be taken care of and loved this man. Who demonstrated what it's like to be a neighbor? Who demonstrated this? And they're like, the Samaritan. And Jesus is like, now you go and do likewise. See, here's what the problem is. I think for a lot of us, we find ourselves thinking about loving other people and we just go with what's normal or what we have known or what we have seen. And Jesus changes all of that. Because in, in Matthew 5, 44, uh, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that doesn't sound fun. I don't like to do that. Like if someone sends me hate mail, my first response isn't, God, I just pray that you would be with them and love. Like, no. Right? And some of you, man, you've experienced that. You, you've experienced people you would even say are your enemy. And your first response isn't like, how can I love them? How can I pray for them, right? You're mad. You're upset. And he says in verse, verses 46 and 47, after that, he says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And, 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 and so what he's doing is he is absolutely transforming what their view of love is because he's like, anybody can love that way. In fact, everybody is. Like, of course you love them. That makes sense for you to love them. You're related. Of course you would love them. They can give you a promotion. Of course you love them. You need them in your life. And so all of a sudden, we start basing these conditions, this, this, this convenience-based love, and Jesus says, uh-uh, this is going to be inconvenient what I'm bringing in. This is actually, you're looking for people, you're looking at people differently and going, you know what, like, like they're different than me, I maybe don't agree with them, uh, maybe I don't even like them, but God, you have called me to love differently and I cannot disconnect, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I can't do it. And, and, and this is sacrificial love. What have people said about Ecclesia? Man, they love well. And they love people well there. Man, they love each other. And not just like, oh, it's normal, or yeah, well, it's church. But no, there is something different. There's just something different. And I pray that, that that's what happens. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The church should be a visible picture and outpost of the coming kingdom of Jesus where people from diverse backgrounds come together in the unity of the gospel 
The church should be hospitable to all people. You should be able to come in here regardless of how you came in, what you did last night, what you've been through. You should be able to come here and experience someone welcoming you and loving you. Why? Because you are an image bearer of God, Genesis 1.26 says. We are created in his image. We are image bearers, and we need to treat each other as image bearers. And what better place to treat someone as an image bearer of God than in the church, the reflection of who he is? And this has to cross our background, ethnicity, our status. In Hebrews 13, uh, 1 and 2, it says, let, brother, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I, I, I tell people, I hope our church looks interesting. And they go, what do you mean? Well, I just pray that when people come in, that because whenever we come into a new church, and some of you, you're like, this would be today, and you come in, you're trying to figure it out. And how are you going to figure it out? Well, first you start looking at people. Hmm. Oh, okay. They all dress like that. Or, oh, it's for this kind of person. Or that. And I pray that when people come in, they're like, I'm confused. This is crazy. How are all these people that look differently, that obviously have different styles, different backgrounds, how are they coming together like this? And they seem to be happy. Like, how, how is this happening? Like, that's, that's, like, only the gospel can do that. The gospel can do that. And so we want to see that uh, happen in our church. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how we approach each other. It says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. In other words, I should be, if I'm approaching anybody here, and you're approaching anybody here, we should approach them as mother, father, sisters, uh, brothers, all these things, like, like, like the example. Examples are someone that you respect and would normally love. And, and so if you approach a conversation with someone, even a conflict with someone, with that heart, with that mindset, can you imagine how that's going to transform that conversation? Can you imagine how you're going to deal with them differently? If that's your mindset, if that's how you're looking at them. And, and, and listen, he's saying, like, this is what we want this to look like. This is what the body of Christ should look like. The church is the body of Christ where each person has a different strength, but together serves harmoniously as Christ's agent in the world. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, it says, For in one body, as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Okay, do you understand that? Like, 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 this is what's so beautiful. You are not designed to be just like the person next to you. You, like, like, like God doesn't, like, establish local churches and go, I want to bring together all the same kinds of people with all the same giftings under one roof. That would just bless my soul. Like, no, it is a body, right? It's a body of Christ. Now, when you think about your body, there are a lot of different parts and a lot of different functions. And as we think about the body of Christ, and even like what you're wearing, like, like, like when you think about like, like some of your body is like seen, it's exposed, it's acknowledged, it's celebrated, and other parts are hidden by, on purpose. And, and so like you think about that, and then you think about this, some parts of your body, the, in fact, the most essential parts of your body are hidden, and they're ugly. I mean, you talk about like there's some ugliness up in there. And, and when you stu now some of you are like doctors and that, and you're like, no, it's beautiful. Okay, that's great. That's why you do that, and I don't. But listen, when you open it up and all these things and, 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 and all of this, but, but listen, he says, I am creating the body. Like, like this is what it's going to look like, and it's going to have all these functions, all these purposes. And so there is no mistake that you are here. If you are called to be here without you coming, without you exercising your gift, we are not the full picture of the body of Christ. And you're like, well, I just do that. So be a pinky. Like, 
I don't know, like, like, like just be what he's called you to be and step out how he's asked you to step out and you will help this local church body complete the picture that God himself has designed it to be. And without you in that, we are, we are unable to fulfill that. And so you have need here. We want you here. And God, if he's calling you here, I just want to challenge you. It does not matter if you are noticed or not noticed like he sees and he is honored and glorified when you do it with the heart that says, God, I'm just going to be obedient to you. And he'll create this incredible image of who he is. You know, whenever there's a division or, or people are talking about other people, I always try to remind people that it is our role to try to protect and reflect the image of God. And so when we think about, like, like, like when we start to tear someone down or, 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 or talk about this group or, or that person, like, like, listen, you are distorting the image of God. And listen, what you're saying may be true. Ooh. Just because what you're saying is true about someone else doesn't give us the right, especially within the body of Christ, to tear someone down or, 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 or speak about them in that way. Like, 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 you want to talk about what a dysfunctional body looks like? That's what a dysfunctional body will look like when it's working against, against itself. And so we want to be in, in harmony, unified together around glorifying Jesus Christ. As a result of that, we're going to love each other differently. We just are. In John 13, 35, it says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And remember, this is not a love. Or this is a fruit of the spirit kind of love. Fruit of the spirit kind of love is a love you cannot produce on your own. Okay, so, so it's not talking about, oh, well, I love my mom. I talked to her the other day. Like, no, like you can produce that. This is something that God says there is a level of love within you that some of you have never even given that God can do, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit activated in your life. And, and so some of us, we haven't even experienced the fullness of this yet. There is a love in you that you have to give that can only be explained as coming from the Holy Spirit. That's how big it is. That's how different it is. And, and, and people will not say, when we're exercising in this, when our church is operating in this, people will not say, well, that makes sense. No, it can only be explained as God. And some of you have exercised love for other people or a specific person in a way that honestly surprised you and you went, that could have only been God. That's what we're talking about. Moving forward, this church is going to love well. And it's, it, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. But we want to commit to that. We want to be all in with that. Here's the reality, you guys. Our, our, our church, we're called to make disciples, right? Matthew 28, 19. Make disciples. If we haven't learned about Jesus, how do we follow and glorify Jesus, right? And so here's, here's what I really want to challenge some of us with today, and I've got specific challenges each week that I'm excited as we think about what's forward, moving forward, and I want to specific talk about, I specifically talk about mentoring for a second, because when we talk about mentoring, some of you have heard that, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm a counselor or a life coach? Like, no. That's not what it means, and if it means that, you need to be mentored by somebody else because it's become unhealthy, okay? Um, what we're saying is, by being a mentor, is it's teaching a young follower of Jesus to know and to obey God's word. It's learning how to follow Jesus. It's walking through that, and you may be like 15 and need that. You may be 55 and need that. You may be new to this. You need to be mentored. You need someone to disciple you. I want to challenge you. We have had people come to know Jesus, and God has been working. And if you have never been mentored, and I'm sitting here preaching about glorifying Jesus, and you don't even know Jesus really, or, or you're like new to Jesus, you're like, I don't know what I'm glorifying. I don't know what I'm magnifying. Like, yes, I want to be, that sounds cool to be coming here. For, you need to be mentored first. And so if you have not been mentored, and listen, I know like, like oh, well, Ecclesia, we mentor in that. We have mentors waiting right now. We should not have any mentors waiting. God's doing too much. So if you need to be mentored today, I'm going to ask you as, as we uh, close, I'm going to ask you to go sign up to get mentored. For some of you that used to mentor or gave up on mentoring, 
I want to challenge some of you to go, maybe God's not done, or maybe he has something new or someone new that he's going to call me to be utilized in their life to point them to Jesus. And just maybe you're that perfect match. I want to challenge some of you to sign up to be mentors. God doesn't waste our stories. He redeems our stories and presents opportunities for, to use those. And if that's you, I, I want to challenge you to do that today. And, and, and listen, once again, we're not asking you to be a professional counselor or a life coach. We're asking you to disciple somebody, teach them about Jesus. In order for us to love one another in this place, we have to get to a place where we are actually known, right? Because it is easy to just kind of come in and be like, and I'm out. Like it is, like, like you could do that for a long time. And maybe for you today, I want to challenge you with community. Like, listen, like, like this, this like, like transformation is never meant to be just about this individual experience with God. Transformation um, happens and is designed to be experienced with other people. And, and so when we, when we have that, like, like we want this to be a place, like yeah, we want to collectively come here, but we want people, iron sharpening iron, we want incredible relationships, people praying together in homes, in communities, all throughout Lane County. And, and so, and, and some of you are like, well, I've heard communities or that, or I don't have a particular mission. Listen, some of them, yes, they have a specific thing that they're focused on. But you know what? We really want to open the door with this. I am so passionate about this. We, we want people to be having community in their homes. And so, like, if you're somebody that's like, hey, man, like, like there's this Bible study. Like, we want to help facilitate Bible study. We want to help facilitate people meeting, whether it's in homes. It doesn't have to be in a home. It could be in an apartment. It could be at a, at a different place. Like, but we want to facilitate that. And, and one of the things, too, is I, I meet people like, oh, I don't know, I can't do that, I can't teach. And, and, and I'm like, well, do you want to have people in your home? Do you want to facilitate that? And, and they're like, yeah, I feel called to do that. And I go, well, guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be um, bringing uh, and, and delivering questions based upon the sermon, and you can facilitate those discussion questions. Does that, can you do that? Yeah, I can facilitate that. And we could pray. Yeah, you could totally do that. And, 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 and yeah, a, a lot of times we want, we'd love to see like you guys eat together. Listen, it's always easier to walk into a setting and eat versus not eat, but you don't have to eat. You don't have to. You could be the fasting community. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but but I, want you to, I want you to think like, because like, we create all these like requirements, like, like, oh, I'm single and I know how it goes in churches. I'm singled out. For being single. You don't have to be married. I saw a single come up to me and go, I'm ready. I'm like, great. Like, like you don't have to be married to, to start a community. And so I just want to encourage for some of you that you've heard a definition, you've heard something that scares you, you've gone like, no way, or I'm not equipped. Like, like I think we can facilitate these things. And I, I want to see our church explode with communities because that's when I know like we're going to see incredible prayer together happening. We're going to see relationships built, established. The community that I had in my home in San Diego, those people are still some of the closest people to me that, that I've ever had in my whole life. And it wasn't like, hey, we're going to be the closest group ever. No, like God just started doing that. And you know what else? Sometimes it's intimidating to come to a middle school for your church, first church experience. It's a little different if I ask my neighbor, hey, you want to come over and hang out? We're going to eat. And we're going to have some people over. Now, don't shock them and, you know, sit in a circle and be like, we're glad that you're here. They're going to think it's something totally different. And... Uh, but this is an opportunity to grow and develop in community and relationship outside of these walls. We want to encourage that. We want to cultivate that. And you know what? If you have kids, we, and I am so passionate about this, I want my kids to know that my relationship with God is not just Sundays. I want them to know it's not a switch I turn on and off. And I want them to see me in community. I just want to challenge us with that. If you need to sign up to, to lead or host a community, and maybe you've never done that before. Sign up. We'll take you through a training. And you don't have to do it. But maybe God's also calling you to be in a community. And if that's you and you're like, man, I, I need to do that. I'm ready for that. I want to challenge you to take that step of faith and sign up.
to be a part of a community. Those are the two things I really want you to, to think and process through this morning. Um, next week, I, I'm really excited to talk about outreach. But today, I, I think it's really important that we establish we want to glorify Jesus and love other people. And, and as we do that, this is how it's going to play out for us. We want people to be discipled and mentored. And I think we need to reignite that. I think this church is ready for that. And, and, and I think, you know, when we think about communities, I just, I just feel like, like that, that is something that, that takes us to the next level as we engage with each other and grow and press in and, and have accountability together. And it's a beautiful thing. Amen.